Chapter Six of Esther Waters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget. Esther Waters by George Moore. Chapter Six. The boys were playing ball in the stables, but she did not feel as if she wanted to romp with them. There was a stillness and a sweetness abroad which penetrated and absorbed her. She moved towards the paddock gate. The pony and the donkey came towards her, and she rubbed their muzzles in turn. It was a pleasure to touch anything, especially anything alive. She even noticed that the elm trees were strangely tall and still against the calm sky, and the rich odor of some carnations which came through the bushes from the pleasure ground excited her. The scent of earth and leaves tingled in her, and the cawing of the rooks coming home took her soul away skyward in an exquisite longing. She was, at the same time, full of romantic love for the earth, and of a desire to mix herself with the innermost essence of things. The beauty of the evening and the sea breeze instilled a sensation of immortal health, and she wondered if a young man came to her as young men came to the great ladies in Sarah's books, how it would be to talk in the dusk, seeing the bats flitting and the moon rising through the branches. The family was absent from Woodview, and she was free to enjoy the beauty of every twilight and every rising moon for still another week but she wearied for a companion. Sarah and Grover were far too grand to walk out with her, and Margaret had a young man who came to fetch her, and in their room at night she related all he had said. But for Esther there was nothing to do all the long summer evenings but to sit at the kitchen window sewing. Her hands fell on her lap, and her heart heaved a sigh of weariness. In all this world there was nothing for her to do but to continue her sewing or to go for a walk on the hill. She was tired of that weary hill, but she could not sit in the kitchen till bedtime. She might meet the old shepherd coming home with his sheep, and she put a piece of bread in her pockets for his dogs, and strolled up the hillside. Margaret had gone down to the gardens. One of these days a young man would come to take her out. What would he be like? She laughed the thought away. She did not think that any young man would bother much about her. Happening at that moment to look round, she saw a man coming through the hunting gate. His height and shoulders told her that he was William. Trying to find Sarah, she thought, I must not let him think I am waiting for him. She continued her walk, wondering if he were following, afraid to look round. At last she fancied she could hear footsteps. Her heart beat faster. He called to her. I think Sarah has gone to the gardens, she said, turning round. You always keep reminding me of Sarah. There's nothing between us. Anything there ever was is all off long ago. Are you going for a walk? She was glad of the chance to get a mouthful of fresh air, and they went towards the hunting gate. William held it open, and she passed through. The plantations were enclosed by a wooden fence, and beyond them the bare downs rose hill after hill. On the left the land sloped into a shallow valley sown with various crops, and the shaws about Elliot's farm were the last trees. Beyond the farmhouse the downs ascended higher and higher, treeless, irreclaimable, scooped into long patriarchal solitudes, thrown into wild crests. There was a smell of sheep in the air, and the flock trotted past them in good order followed by the shepherd, a huge hat and a crook in his hand, and two shaggy dogs at his heels. A brace of partridges rose out of the sandfoin and flew down the hills, and watching their curving flight Esther and William saw the sea under the sun setting, and the string of coast towns. A lovely evening, isn't it? Esther acquiesced, and tempted by the warmth of the grass they sat down, and the mystery of the twilight found way into their consciousness. We shan't have any rain yet a while. How do you know? "'I'll tell you,' William answered, eager to show his superior knowledge. "'Look due southwest, straight through that last dip in the line of hills. "'Do you see anything?' "'No, I can see nothing,' said Esther, after straining her eyes for a few moments. "'I thought not. "'Well, if it was going to rain, you would see the Isle of Wight.' "'For something to say, and hoping to please, Esther asked him where the race-course was. "'There, over yonder. "'I can't show you the start. "'A long way behind that hill, Portslade Way.' Then they come right along by that gorse, and finish up by Truly Barn. You can't see Truly Barn from here. That's Thunder's Barrow Barn. They go quite half a mile farther. And does all that land belong to the gaffer? Yes, and a great deal more, too. But this downland isn't worth much. Not more than about ten shillings an acre. And how many acres are there? Do you mean all that we can see? Yes. The gaffer's property reaches to Southwick Hill, and it goes north a long way. I suppose you don't know that all this piece, all that lies between us and that barn yonder, once belonged to my family. To your family? 
"'Yes, the latches were once big swells, and the time of my great-grandfather. "'The Barfields could not hold their heads as high as the latches. "'My great-grandfather had a pot of money, but it all went. "'Racing?' "'A good bit, I've no doubt. "'A rare ard liver, cock-fighting, hunting, horse-racing from one year's end to the other. "'Then after him came my grandfather. "'He went to the law, and a sad mess he made of it. "'Went stony broke, and left my father without a sixpence. "'That is why mother didn't want me to go into the livery.' The family had been coming down for generations, and mother thought that I was born to restore it, and so I was, but not as she thought, by carrying parcels up and down the King's Road. Esther looked at William in silent admiration, and feeling that he had secured an appreciative listener, he continued his monologue regarding the wealth and rank his family had formerly held, till a heavy dew forced them to their feet. In front of them was the moon, and out of the forlorn sky looked down the misted valleys. The crests of the hills were still touched with light, and lights flew from coast town to coast town, weaving a luminous garland. The sheep had been folded, and seeing them lying in the grayness of this hillside, and beyond them the massive moonlit landscape and the vague sea, Esther suddenly became aware, as she had never done before, of the exceeding beauty of the world. Looking up into William's face, she said, "'Oh, how beautiful!' As they descended the droveway, their feet raised the chalk, and William said, "'This is bad for silver braid. We shall want some more rain in a day or two.' "'Let's come for a walk round the farm,' he said suddenly. "'The farm belongs to the gaffer, but he's let the lodge to a young fellow called Johnson. "'He's the chap that Peggy used to go after. "'There was awful rose about that, and worse when he forestalled the gaffer about Egmont. "'The conversation wandered agreeably, and they became more conscious of each other. "'He told her all he knew about the chap who jilted Miss Mary, "'and the various burlesque actresses at the Shoreham Gardens, "'who had captivated Ginger's susceptible heart.' While listening, she suddenly became aware that she had never been so happy before. Now all she had endured seemed accidental. She felt that she had entered into the permanent, and in the midst of vague but intense sensations, William showed her the pigeon-house, with all the bluebirds dozing on the tiles, a white one here and there. They visited the workshop, the forge, and the old cottages, where the bailiff and the shepherd lived. And all this inanimate nature, the most insignificant objects, seemed inspired, seemed like symbols of her emotion. They left the farm, and wandered on the high road, until a stile leading to a cornfield beguiled them, and then delayed their steps. The silence of the moonlight was clear and immense, and they listened to the trilling of the nightingale, and the copse hard by. First they sought to discover the brown bird in the branches of the poor hedge, and then the reason of the extraordinary emotion in their hearts. It seemed that all life was beating in that moment, and they were as it were inflamed to reach out their hands to life and to grasp it together. Even William noticed that, and the moon shone on the mist that had gathered on the long marsh lands of the foreshore. Beyond the trees the land wavered out into downland, the river gleamed, and intensely. This moment was all the poetry of their lives, the striking of a match to light his pipe which had gone out, put the music to flight, and all along the white road he continued his monologue, interrupted only by the necessity of puffing at his pipe. Mother says that if I had two pence worth of pride in me, I wouldn't have consented to put on the livery. But what I says to mother is, what's the use of having pride if you haven't money? I tells her that I am rotten with pride, but my pride is to make money. I can't see that the man what is willing to remain poor all his life has any pride at all. But, Lord, I have argued with mother till I'm sick. She can see nothing further than the livery. That's what women are. They're that short-sighted. A lot of good it would have done me to have carried parcels all my life, and when I could do four mile an hour no more, to be turned out to die in the ditch, and be buried by the parish. Not good enough, says I. If that's your pride, mother, you may put it in your pipe and smoke it, and as you haven't got a pipe, perhaps behind the oven will do as well. That's what I said to her. I saw well enough there was nothing for me but service, and I means to stop here until I can get on three or four good things, and then retire into a nice comfortable public house, and do my own bedding. "'You would give up betting, then?' "'I'd give up backing horses, if you mean that. "'What I should like would be to get on a dozen good things at long prices. "'Half a dozen like Silver Braid would do it. "'For a thousand or fifteen hundred pounds I could have the Red Lion, "'and just inside my own bar I could do a hundred-pound book on all the big races.' "'Esther listened, hearing interminable references to jockeys, publicans, weights, odds, "'and the certainty, if he had the Red Lion, "'of being able to get all Joe Walker's betting business away from him.' Allusions to the police, and the care that must be taken, not to bet with any one who had not been properly introduced, frightened her. But her fears died in the sensation of his arm about her waist, 
and the music that the striking of a match had put to flight had begun again in the next plantation, and it began again in their hearts. But if he were going to marry Sarah— The idea amused him. He laughed loudly, and they walked up the avenue, his face bent over hers. End of chapter 6